Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited to be here, quote unquote, if you will. Uh, very sad that I couldn't travel. I, I overdo everything in life, and my wife would have killed me, but <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be here. So I'm going to be talking about some fun tools and techniques that you can utilize to identify lateral movement and to not just recover, not just deleted files, but also that you can access files by simply having typically what we refer to as triage data within your cases. So these are some of the methods that we use day in and day out at BlackBerry, where I work as a principal consultant. Um, I'm the author of SANS Forensics 528, Ransomware for Incident Responders. Oh, ransomware, right? That's what we're here for. And I'm the sponsor slash community liaison for CactusCon. That's a fun way to say that word. And uh, other stuff. I like retro video games. If you can see me, I have game consoles like right behind me over my shoulder here. So that's enough about me. We're going to talk about tools that I primarily want to focus on like two big things here, right? One is quick and easy. Nah, that's a lie. That's two things. And free. A tools, and then for that matter, the enable at a glance analysis. I want folks to be able to quickly spin up a tool, drop data into that tool, right? Adjust the data, and then be able to see all kinds of fun stuff. Specific to that, this is the type of talk that I usually do not give. Typically, I do the types of talks where I have a ton of tooling that's required, and we talk about all this analysis at scale. And I often receive the feedback that it doesn't work really great for teams that have boots on the ground, and especially those teams that are law enforcement based. So uh, shout out to actually Aaron, technically, who gave me some of that feedback initially. This is geared towards everyone, but specifically to those folks. This should help quite a bit. At least that's my hope. So first off, this is a cute little background that was AI generated using mid journey. I don't know if you folks are on that yet, but maybe you shouldn't because if you start doing it now, like it's a little addicting to say the least. So we're gonna talk about tracking lateral movement first, okay? So lateral movement in a ransomware investigation or ransomware case is often done via SMB, server message blocking, RDP, which the previous talk, we just learned about RDP, right? And I'm sure throughout the day, you've heard much about it. The background intelligent transfer service, WIN remote management and WMI, Windows management instrumentals. Yeah, those are great to have all those on the slide, but when it really comes down to it, these are our guys right here. SMB and RDP are the most common by far utilized for lateral movement throughout an environment, right? If you want to find out exactly how SMB works, there's a great article that I've linked here that I have a bunch of shortened articles, uh, shortened links, I should say, for, that are on my 4528.com. It's just so that if you change the article name, I can link to them easily and quickly for the class purposes. But if you check out this guy right here, in fact, it's so cool. I'm going to click on it. Give me one sec. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Here's a breakdown. Hopefully you see my screen here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. If you are familiar with working ransomware cases, you've probably seen PS exec, right? Duh. You've probably seen SMB exec, especially in relation to the framework called Impacket. And if you have ever wondered how exactly do these things like work, like how does this occur? This is a phenomenal freaking article. I have a whole portion in my class where we talk about this how the PSEXE service creates a remote service and uses name pipes for communication and so on and so forth. Really, really cool technical breakdown and gives you a, a like a you know, really in-depth view into how exactly does this all happen if you have name pipe creation and or connection events available within your environment. Heck, if you have Sysmon or even if you don't, like go install it, then you'll have access to some additional kind of um, IOCs that you may not be looking at right now. So I just wanted to throw that one out there because it's something I, I really like. There's a phenomenal, just phenomenal. And yes, I use that word too much, but that's okay. So the Japan CERT team has put together this document. It came out back in June of 2017, right? So we're coming on five years now, but it is, what did I call it? Phenomenal. I love it. This thing is really, really cool. It gives you a breakdown of how to identify lateral movement via very common avenues, right? So if I go to the WinRM section, right, there's a lot to look at. So I know you probably can't even read the text on the screen right now. And if I zoomed in so you could read it, it would kind of defeat the purpose because I'm going to show you that in this particular, I'll just call it an article for now, although it's more like a, a guidebook or a handbook, if you will. If you look here, you have the major section, like what are we looking at, right? And then you get a breakdown up top for each of these as to like, why, 
what does this do? What per, what capabilities does this provide the threat actor and things of that nature? And then you get a full breakdown on what you should be collecting, where that data is coming from, including the source host, the source log event type, the log provider, all that fun stuff. So I just threw those links in there because I think they're pretty useful. But let's talk about what threat actors do in order to move laterally. The first thing that they do, and this is the slide, just I pulled it from my class, uh, the new 528. And this is showing that in order for a threat actor to know where to move laterally, we need to identify and enumerate within the environment what other hosts and, and things um, that may tantalize them, right? So there are a number of tools, programs on this slide here that we see in ransomware cases. You're probably familiar with some of these names, including, for example, like Advanced IP Scanner or NMAP. These are things we see all the time. These particular tools are like just absolutely adored by threat actors. We see them all the time in ransomware cases, and it's important for you to be able to recognize them and identify that if they're in your environment and you're not the one using them, like you, you may have a bit of a whoopsie there. That may be a problem. So once the threat actors identify, hey, look, there's this place. I want to go touch it. I want to go play with things, right? And they start doing that. How can you identify that? One way that I really like to show you is to use a tool called Logon Tracer. So this tool is also, by the way, from the, G the JP Cert. So shout out to them. There's a reason I want to show off their, their article, or as I call it, like a desk side compendium or like you know, a guidebook or something. Really, really cool tool. You go check out the source code over at uh, on GitHub. So 4528.com slash L Tracer for Logon Tracer. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. The tool is fan freaking tastic. However, it does not take into account every single possible lateral movement event. Rather, it specifically focuses on the event IDs that we see here on the screen. So if you're wondering to yourself, hey, does this take into account terminal services? Well, you may get a 4624 type 10 or even a type 3 if, NTL, if uh, network level authentication in LA is enabled or not, depending on your environment. But notice we're not seeing things like event IDs 21 through 25 and 11 of 49, all those fun things, right? So those are not technically here, but for what it does, it's freaking awesome. All right, so check it out, log on Tracer. Installation is really, really easy, especially if you like to use Docker, or even if you don't like to use Docker, you should use it anyway in this case, because it makes it trivial. It does use Elastic as the backend database, but using the Docker image, you basically just go, hey, go, and then, um, then it goes. So we have a SIFT VM. It's a derivative of the SIFT workstation, the Linux Ubuntu-based SIFT workstation. If you're familiar with the, the SANS, well, SIFT workstation, we modified that one a, a bit for my course. All I did was I went into that VM. I simply followed the instructions that we had here at the link. It's just a, a GitHub link, by the way, nothing special. See, it shows you here. How do you pull the Docker image? You run that. Then what do you do? How do you run it? You run that, right? The only thing I replaced is that guy right there. I'll zoom way in, see the IP address? I just set that little sucker to 127.001. That's all I did. Okay, so that then will publish Logon Tracer to port 8080. Now, a couple of things to note. There are programmatic ways. There's a command line methodology in order to ingest or to, I guess, push EBTX files, or you can also ingest XML data directly. So depending on how you export your case information, your artifacts, I should say. In this case, I want to show you that I specifically just pulled in a security.evtx file, right? I literally just went over to Win32 and I went to you know, the event log. I was like, I want that guy. And I just copied it out. Okay. If you're acquiring your data for your ransomware cases using CAPE or Siler or Kanza or Velociraptor, or you literally just, you know, if you're for whatever reason, logging onto the machine directly, right? And you're like, hey, let's just go to the event, the EVTX files, copy the freaking thing out. So I ingested two EVTX files for this demo. They come from the network range. It's you know part of my course and, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to show you how easy it was to simply just ingest the two files and then get a bird's eye view of what the heck happened. What did the threat actor do? You know, lateral movement wise, connectivity wise. So as a note, when you're using Logon Tracer, there's a feature where you click log, right, as you're uploading data. That feature is what we see on the left-hand side. It does not show the line breaks in your standard web browser. But if you simply just choose view source, 
or go directly to the file on disk. But this is even easier. Just choose view source. You will then see the line break. It's just a random thing for usability because it can be kind of annoying trying to read the logs as they're presented by default. So I figured I'd show you that. Okay. So let's do it. Let's do a quick little demo here and talk about log on tracer. A couple of things to mention right off the bat. I could spend I, hours and hours and hours just talking about this tool. Okay. So we have a very limited amount of time here together. And I'm seeing that we're about 10 minutes into my 25 minute presentation now. So we're good. I want to show you that um, this tool is extremely capable and it even shares the types of things that you might expect from a tool like uh, Bloodhound to a degree. Okay, so more on that coming up. Let me full screen this bad boy. All right, so this is the web interface for Logon Tracer. I'm going to zoom in a little more so you can hopefully see it a little bit better here. Now, at the bottom left hand side, you'll see that I can upload an event log. And that's what I did. Right? I set my time zone to zero and I uploaded an EVTX file. If you're law enforcement, if you have boots on the ground and you just basically just grab some quick EVTX files, at least grab the security.evtx from your target host or hosts and drop the suckers in here. Okay. Again, I usually talk about ingestion at scale, like using time sketch and pulling in all this data. Right now, let's just say you have one machine that's of, of concern, right? Or you have the domain controller, or, which is usually one of your primary target devices for a ransomware case, right? Or you have like just a smaller SMB type of operation. Um, you know, many folks may not realize that when organizations don't have the ability themselves to handle situations, they typically will contact like the FBI via their triple C website, as I call it. Many of those cases will go over to the Secret Service. And the Secret Service has all these different cool training mechanisms and, and all these different things that they'll provide to local precincts. If you are not yet familiar with the NCFI, National Cyber Forensics Institute, run by the Secret Service, make sure you Google that. Go check that out. Secret Service NCFI. Anywho, a little digression there. In those situations, you may have like just a single file. You browse to it. You upload it. You're golden, right? I've done, I've done that with two files. So in here, let me give you an example. At the top left-hand side, you can choose usernames, host names, or IP addresses on which to search, right? Now, in this case, I'm going to use this filter button up here towards the top, and I'm going to take out 4625 events. The re So like, out. I don't want that checked. Now you go away like that. The reason I'm doing that in this particular data set, I have a terminal services server EVTX file and a, a domain controller EVTX file from our network environment, right? From the, the target victim, if you will. That was internet facing at the terminal services server. There were a ton of attempted connections, not just from us while carrying out our attacks, but from just, you know, threat actors on the internet, because why not? It's internet exposed. So I'm gonna take those out. You may want to actually keep those to get information about like host names that are trying to connect into your environment, which may designate the types of tools that are being used and things of that nature. I'm taking that sucker out. Okay, at the top left-hand side, I can choose the type of logons that I want to take a look at. For right now, I'm going to choose all users. Click. When I choose all users, I get this cute little graph, right? So I can scroll up and down like this. I can move my graph up and around. I can also zoom in or out. That's way too zoomed in. This is the default type of graph. I actually prefer this guy right here. Boop. The uh, spring-loaded, whatever the heck it is, Kose is how it's pronounced. So I'm going to click on that graph type, and then I'm going to go back up here and click all users and rerun the, the query and check it out. Oop, I just lost you. Where'd you go? There you are. Yeah, there we go. So I see that we have these different types of logons. These are the event IDs. What if I want more information? I can add in the count, the type, and the authentication methodology. I'm going to take out the count just for a moment so you see what I'm talking about and click again on all users. And then I'm going to make it a little easier for us to view this. I'm going to zoom in one more. And I say, I'll take that guy. I say, you go over there. You go there. You go right there. And you go right there. And then finally, you go right. Come here. Oh, oh. Uh, all right. I won't finagle it too much. I lied. There it is. So in this case, you see that we have these numbers of logins. We see the types of logins. Excuse me. I took out the count. So here we see that we've got from some desktop called desktop-1cpfbpq. Bar barbecue? Barbecue. 
I'm hungry. And it shows the IP address right here, right? Right away, I can tell you that in this case, this was not one of the host names that should have been connecting to our victim environment, nor was this IP address. That's something that you would look into, right? In this case, this particular host connected via 4624. Type three is network, type 10 is RDP, and they used an account called SAM admin service. That account should not exist. That account did not exist prior to the attack. So what is that account doing there, right? On top of that, we see over here that this account was utilized on the terminal services O2 server, okay? And then over here, we see that another account called administrator with an E, administrator, I don't know, was utilized via a tech three network login to the DC itself. That account also should not exist. So we see this right off the bat by simply just choosing all users after importing the two EVTX files. If I grab this desktop machine, I click on it. I see the name and the IP address. I can click search and I can refine my search. And now I get a search just based on this host. Let's say this host also happened to authenticate in with other different usernames to other machines so on and so forth. Then you would actually see that information right here. You can also be specific about like your RDP logon type. So I can choose like, hey, I just want to see the RDP. Thus, I'm not seeing the type 3 login. I'm just seeing the type 10, even though technically I know that if NLA is enabled, you may actually only see type 3 is not a type 10 still. Remember, the tool is not designed to do the analysis for you. It's designed to do the visualization for you. So you still need to be kind of familiar with the fact that, it's um, that it relies on very specific event IDs and doesn't necessarily have all the logic because that's where you come in. So in this case, we have all these fun little things we could see in the tool. There's also these features on the left-hand side, detect DC sync attacks and add in deletion of users. These particular logs, I actually removed the user account creation uh, from the logs before I pushed them into the EBTX file. That was part of the class we'll be cover. Were I not to have done that though, and we're wondering like, how was that account created? I might find out by just clicking right here and seeing that that account was created. Where was it created? When was it created? And then from there, clicking on things and again, kind of pivoting on my search. So here I clicked on this account and I see that it had interactivity from whatever the heck that desktop was. I see that desktop's IP and then, oh look, it hit my terminal services server. Why, why did it do that? What's going on there? So I will digress. There's a ton more that I could show you about this tool, but the whole idea is to show you a tool that's easy to install, like the pulling down the Docker and then running the Docker image, like should take no more than five minutes if you have Docker installed. If, you're, if you've never even used Docker, it should, you know, it depends on your timing with familiarity of new virtualization mechanisms and such. Well, it's not virtualism, but containerization, I should say. But overall, it's pretty darn easy. And there's a non-Docker way to install it also. So I have to digress on that. I want to talk about it so much more, but really, really cool tool. Very, very easy to get a bird's eye view. Right away, I know that we have an external device name. I want to check that in all my other logs, right? I want to check it in all my other locations. And I know I have two account names and I'm like, what, what's that? Those aren't supposed to be there. Like, get out of here. And then I can go into my domain controller and check those accounts. When were they created? Where were they created? So on and so forth. Okay. Now we're going to move into recovering MFT resident files. Let me check my time here. We've been going. All right, perfect. So the master file table in the new technology file system, the MFT, I'm assuming that most people are familiar with the file. If you're not familiar in general with the MFT, the breakdown is pretty simple. The MFT is basically a file that points to, it serves as a catalog for all the files that are on the disk, right? A disk that's formatted in TFS. And it points to where all the files reside on the disk. That's a very simplistic view of the MFT. However, the master file table can actually contain files within it, as opposed to the files being somewhere else on the disk in some other sectors outside the MFT's space, right? And the MFT simply just points to them they are resident if they're a certain size. They will simply just be included in the master file table. If I go and I make a file called, you know, farts.txt because I'm a mature adult, and that file is very small, say 500 to 900 bytes maybe, which is on the slide towards the bottom there, the MFT may actually essentially absorb the file. That's a silly way of saying it because it doesn't, it's not sentient. But anyways, the breakdown is simple. The MFT records are all one kilobyte, 1,024 bytes, 
Okay, I forgot my comma right there, but you get the idea. There it is right there. If the metadata and the file data itself, the total size of that is less than 1024, the file itself will actually rely, reside inside the MFT. When you do your triage collections, what do you typically pull? One of the main things you should be pulling is the MFT. Maybe you have the MFT and you don't have access to the disk image or you don't have access, access to the host for whatever reason or getting it could be a you know, pain in the rear end. All these methods, right? All these different situations are conducive to analyzing the MFT and trying to pull files out of it. And that's where MFTE CMD, MFTE command comes into play. You can learn about it at this link here. It's just the GitHub repo. That's all that is. This is one of the popular Eric Zimmerman tools. Everyone knows Zimmerman tools, right? If you're not familiar with them, you definitely want to check out Zimmerman tools in general. There are a number of tools, a very handy script that shows you or provides the capability to keep them up to date, so on and so forth. In 528, we, re we rely heavily on the Zimmerman tools. And for that matter, let's pretend that wasn't up. We actually have them all installed. So here's, you know, in our course VM, all the Zimmerman tools. It's a fantastic tool. MFTE command can parse your MFT and your J file. That's the USN journal file, the J log of the USN journal association, basically. And um, a small world story. We were running the Forensics 528 Alpha for my class, and I was all excited. And... Eric was not able to attend, but he was kind of just lurking in the chat, you know, like, eh, see if Ryan's class sucks or not, <laughs> right? I, get, I, hope, I hope he was liking it, I guess. Someone in the class, a student mentioned, you know, it'd be really cool. It'd be really cool if, as opposed to, you know, trying to manually pull files out the MFT, like what if like MFTE command or some, something like that gave you the ability to just dump everything, like just dump out all the resident files. So all the small text files, all the small bat files or PowerShell files or visual basic scripting files, all the cool stuff like that we might want, you know, could just be dumped out. Within an hour, Eric dumped in the chat, hey, I noticed someone said that, here's an updated version. Done, it was, it was already available and it was working right out of the box. <laughs> Freaking phenomenal. I'm really, really excited that that situation occurred. Here's how useful this can be. I was working a case for a ransomware crew that is actually brand new, right? We published an article on it. They go by the name Monty, not Conti with a C, but Monty with an M. That's cute, right? So we just published this article, like what, last week, right? Yeah, last week. I'm asking myself, I guess. In this particular case that I was working, I used this tool. I used MFTE command, the way I'm going to show you right now. And I was able to identify the file you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, what we're looking at on the right-hand side of the screen is a file called, what is this? And I was actually asking myself, what is this? <laughs> I don't know what this file is. It turns out it was actually somewhat of a, of a license, not, not a license per se, but it's a readme file for what's known as the Action One Remote Monitoring and Maintenance Agent, right? One of the things, one of the primary, and I wouldn't say only, but one of the main things that set Monty apart from Conti, read the article to you know, see what I mean by that, was the fact that they used Action 1. Every other ransomware actor under the sun uses all kinds of other fun tools. In this case, they also used AnyDesk, but they also used Action 1. So when they used Action 1, we saw that and said, oh, check that out. And by pulling files using MFTE command out of the MFT, I randomly happened across the customer ID that the Monty threat actor was using. And we were then able to contact Action One and say, hey, uh, stop it. Now, uh, operation security wise, that could then lead to all kinds of, a, uh, you know, you have to make some ethical considerations there. You have to talk legal counsel for your client if you're not first party and things like that. But it gives you the ability to then perform threat intelligence analysis using that, that customer ID. And this is just one random example of something I found in a case very recently. So here's how you do it. It's really, really easy. The MFTE command that you run, let me zoom in here a bit. I'm gonna zoom in right there and we're gonna do this. So here's MFTE command. I'm gonna do a dash F for file. And this screenshot is in the PDF that's already on the website. By the way, you can just go grab it. So here I'm just pointing to the MFT file. I've redacted the name of the file. It's an MFT. I tell the tool, hey, that's an MFT. 
And this guy right there, that's our little booger butt right there, the dash dash DR. That means dump out all the resident files, please. And then I'm telling it the, the general information should be parsed to a CSV, stored in temp. By doing that, I get my general output in the temp location here, but even better. And for our purposes, I get this resident data right there. All right. So that resident data that I'm going to receive is going to be a breakdown on all the files that were pulled out of the uh, MFT. So time-wise, I don't have a ton of time to cover this all with you, but what I do want to show you is that when you pull this data out, you get this guy. Hold on. This is the default file that you'll get out. Now, I, I renamed it slightly, but this is what you're going to get. Hey, open the file. Come on. So Excel is chugging on it. It's about 100 megabytes right now. So I'd love to go into all the detail on each of these. A couple things I'll tell you. When you delete a file, generally in Windows, it does not delete the file from the MFT, right? These timestamps seem like, oh, that's useful, but it's actually the timestamps as to when you grab the MFT itself. So you can kind of ignore them. So what I do is I take basically just the base name and the length, and I delete the rest. So I just say, like, all right, well, the directory it was in was temp resident. Well, that's because I, I told the tool to create these files there, right? So a lot of this just isn't really useful to me personally. So I toss all that. I end up with basically just this. And the base name that you're going to get is going to have, and if you go check the documentation, it's going to have the entry number and other MFT metadata in front of it. It'll be those guys right there. All right, so if you take this part off of the file, then you have the actual file name itself. And if you go over to the end of the file, you can actually take the suffix off also, and then you can sort by the suffix. So the way that that looks is like this. You go away. And let's see, I go for non-meta. I ran some Perl expressions. I just don't have enough time to show them to you right now. So this is just the file name itself. So I'm just going to just pop it in here real quick. Sorry about that. Timing wise, it just, just ain't going to happen. But we've got the file name here. So I just say, hey, that's the name. And then I pulled out the suffixes here. Do, 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 do. And I know time wise, I have to wrap it up. So let me get this guy in there like this. Oh, that's the other one I had. Hold on. Here we go. And the suffix like that. And then we take these guys and we make them all, eh, say like 25 width. All right, I'll zoom out a little bit. And then you end up with this. You end up with the base name. At this point, I can go ahead and just be like, hey, I don't really want that right now. I just want to see the file names. And then I get the suffix. And then from here, I can go to filter. And then I can filter my file types, all right? Threat actors love to create text files. They like to push data to text files. In here, this is the example right there. See that guy right there? I found this during a case. I did exactly what I showed you right now. I just used a regular expression to pull out the file suffix. And it says, what is this? And my first question was, what the hell is this? <laughs> I was like, what is this? I, why is it called? What is this? I don't know what that is. And I opened it and I went, oh. Freaking cool. I got the ID that they were using for the one tool that really set them apart from being Conti to this new group called Monty. And it kind of made my day a little bit. There are other things I pulled out and I will just quickly show you time-wise I have here pulled up. I found these guys. Uh, here's the, what is this file, right? There's that guy. I also found this, these two bat files just called, you know, whatever temp.bat. And look what I found here, coin miner installations. Here's another coin miner installer. Here's a script used to elevate process context to a medium integrity in Windows. And here's console history. Here's PowerShell history that I found with them downloading AnyDesk. Yes, they also used AnyDesk. So heads up, that's a known IP, so that's all right to be there. And so yeah, so I got all these things by simply running the command you see in the PDF that I provided. And then basically just looking at that data and going like, what are these text files? What are these bad files? I don't know what the heck these are. And then I reviewed them and I found a bunch of really cool stuff. So if you have an MFT within your case, go dump out all the files, go check for script files. Text dot text is the most important. Look at dog log files. Like see if there's anything in there. Threat actors love to redirect command output text files and silly files. See if they happen to have been in the MFT and pull them out even if they've been deleted.
All right, that's it. Uh, it's time for questions and comments if we have time. Sorry if I went over a little bit, I got a little overzealous. I think I may have uh, curated a good solid two hours of content and mashed it into <laughs> our allotted time. So uh, what do we think? Do we have time for a question or two or are we wrapping? Yeah, no, we do. Thanks, Ryan, for, uh, for that. It was a great talk. Um, uh, who has questions? A Ali will walk around and uh, grab your question. Uh, if, if you want, Ryan, if you can expand your uh, video camera, you're like a tiny corner in the screen. So if, uh, if you can, oh, yeah, stop sharing, I guess may work if you stop sharing. There oh, there you are. So now we can see your beautiful background. There we go. Hi. All right. Two has questions. What? He, he did such a great job for part of the <laughs> Uh, let me see what's a quick question. Uh, so the, the log on tracer app, the, the visualization one, uh, have there been requests to bring in terminal services uh, into that? Or is that kind of a, a necessary addition or is it uh, kind of unneeded uh, since it focuses so much more on the security log events? Or did I misunderstand its capabilities of focusing only on security events? I didn't see any issues raised in GitHub myself, but I know that I did raise an issue in GitHub that ended up being a case specific silliness but they got back to me within a timely manner. And it was more like a, hey, what, what's going on with that? And they actually addressed it right away, if you will. Ended up being, I closed the issue and was like, never mind, I'm dumb. But, <laughs> you know, they got back yeah. to me. So I would recommend definitely looking into that. The JP Cert is a phenomenal freaking team. And yes, I use that word, that modifier too much, that adjective, whatever. But they're really, really cool. So I definitely recommend reaching out to them. You could even potentially fork it and do some of your own stuff and uh, submit to them. You'll notice that like right now, we don't have terminal services logs. So simply just 21 through 25, starting with that, or just starting with 1149, something like, you know, the more hands we have on it, the more it, it could reach a, a wider audience. But as is, it works, it works pretty well. I like it. Cool. All right, let me get a question there. All right, good. Log on tracer work for uh, Sysmon event IDs as well? No, it does not work for Sysmon event IDs, but that's another thing where, if you look in the code base, you can see exactly how they're drawing everything. So the actual graphing manipulation portion is not something you have to worry about coding wise, it's modular in that respect. So if you wanted to help out, or if you wanted to simply ask them like, hey, um, I have Sysmon throughout my environment or on X number of devices, could you implement that? That would be a great idea, especially because I love Sysmon network events because you get host to host, you know, internal network connectivity stuff and a lot of other tools will miss that. And a lot of times there are additional things that you may want to identify that are not necessarily just login. So I know it's called log on tracer, but there's you know a bunch of additional functionality that could be added in there. The graphing part that they already have built in, I dumped a ton of data and well, not about a ton, but I dumped in like 20 EVTX files and it ran. It took a while to chug through the queries and such and build out the graphs, but it ran. Um, for anyone wondering, what about at scale? Time sketch has a built-in graphing capability. So I may have not mentioned that yet in the talk. If you already have time sketch in your environment and you're wondering, well, I already have graphing. Well, yeah, use that. <laughs> this is an alternative to that. And especially for one-off cases where it's uh, very, very handy. But yeah, it's not already looking at terminal services and no sysmon just yet. Awesome. Other questions? One more. All right, hold on. We get to uh... Uh, for decoding, other than using uh, CyberChef, because me know smart enough, is there another tool that you would recommend for uh, decoding obfuscation? Oh, like general obfuscation? Like yeah. um, like PHP and uh, base, well, base 64 is pretty easy, but you know, some other um, encoding, if you're looking at a blob of text, you go, what the heck am I looking at? Um, something that can help with that. Yeah, I so I use language specific ones, which typically require you to kind of know what language it might be, right? But um, we cover like in Forensic 610, we cover uh, the, 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 the Box.js is a great tool. And there's a, a tool that's same concept called PS uh, or Box PS. And it basically is like a sandbox for those languages that it emulates the code and then spits out what would be done. So I highly recommend those. As far as PowerShell, um, there are a number of frameworks. I actually have some links I can get you after if I 
get your information. I don't, don't have them in my head right now. But there's a number of other tools that will look at that, but uh, BoxPS and BoxJS are going to be language specific and they're very, very useful. I like to use awk, sed, grep, and Perl, and I'm obsessed with using those. And um, for anyone who may want to deobfuscate things in general, whether it be malware related, whether it be security event log related, like whatever it may be, you know, where you may find those things. There was a talk done at the Deeper Summit, the SANS Deeper Summit that just passed a month ago or so ago. And it was called something like a regular express or a log parsing for blue teamers or blue cyber defenders or something like that. Phen I'm going to say it again. Phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal talk. And it goes over how to deobfuscate things and how to, um, what we call like text filter using those types of tools like Perl, Aux, said, and just focusing on doing it in the command line. That's the exact opposite of your question. You're like, hey, what's the framework that automates this? And I, I, I gave you a, a horrible answer. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully those first tools I mentioned will help you out. Go Perl. Thank you. Go yeah. Perl. Everyone at Basis thinks I'm crazy for still going to Perl, but it's my default language. Oh, Perl one-liners are where it's, I don't know Perl, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't remember Perl CD, I don't remember all that stuff, but just using the Perl-PE with, you know, a, some text to run a proper regular expression. Oh, love it. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, thanks again, Ryan, for joining us uh, remotely. It's a great yeah. talk, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, folks. I hope everyone's having a blast and I hope everyone has a good time at the after party. All right, thank you.